This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Sig Sauer. My guest today is Danny Trejo. Now, you might know him from films like From Dusk Till Dawn, Desperado, Heat, Machete, film franchise. Uh, Your kids or grandkids might know him from Spy Kids, but his new book was out on Tuesday, July 6th, and it's called Trejo, My Life of Crime, Redemption, and Hollywood. And I was just blown away by this book. Had a great time talking to him. We only had 30 minutes because he's on a press junket for this and uh, probably a bunch of other things because he is in something like 300 plus uh, films and television shows and has been killed more than any actor in the history of Hollywood on screen, of course. So uh, he talks about his time in prison growing up. Uh, Most of his youth was spent in penitentiaries, uh, redemption, fighting addiction, and then his experience in Hollywood, but he is very candid, very open, very honest uh, in this book. It, uh, it's an emotional read with a lot of incredible life lessons that he's sharing with all of us. So, uh, Danny, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you in person one of these days soon. And uh, to everybody else out there watching, pick this up and read it. Uh, and also watch Inmate Number One. You can find that, I believe it's on uh, Apple TV. Uh, find that, it's a documentary about Danny Trejo's life. It's fantastic. Watch that, read the book, and without further ado, Danny Trejo. Okay. Danny Trejo, how are you? Good, man. thank you. Oh, oh my gosh, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. Uh, thank you so much for writing this, but uh, man, I sincerely appreciate you uh, taking time to sit down with me. Yeah, we had to do, do thank Donald Lowe, because that's the first person I, I, I ever found, I was looking for somebody, you know, everybody that came was like an English literature major, you know, but Donald was kind of an, an English literature major, but from the street. So okay. it was, he was able to just, re, and he grew up in Calexico, you know, right by the border. Mm-hmm. So he kind of understood, you know, the, in fact, they called him, El Rojo, because the red hair, you know, but yeah, yeah, you know, I saw him on the uh, uh, inmate number one, the documentary, which was I mm-hmm. recommend everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. That was a, you guys did a great job with that. And uh, and you met him on the set of Reindeer Games. Is that right? You know what? I actually met him at the Hollywood Drug and Alcohol Center. Oh, first. OK. Yeah. Eight years before that. Nine years. OK. Before that. And I got to say, he was probably one of the angriest Dudes, I've ever met, and I met crazy <laughs> angry people. You know, not yeah, yeah. you met some angry people. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I mean, he was just such an angry kid. And, and uh, I remember, God, if that kid goes to prison, he'll kill him. You know, he'll die. You know, I mean, I could just because it was that kind of anger that gets you killed because people are scared to death of you. You know, and uh, and uh, God, then when I met him on Reindeer Games, he was going through a big thing, and we just bonded i mean we just bonded and we became good friends and so the first time we started talking about a a book and stuff and wrote a chapter and i i showed it to my kid's mom mave and she said sounds like you talking it really did and I said, if his okay. name wasn't on here i would have had no idea that it wasn't you telling every single word of this i mean it is tell you telling this but it's with with him uh putting it under these these words here but it sounds exactly like you and uh and first off you thank you for writing this it's going to help so many people which is a theme of the redemptive side of uh of your life um and you talk about in here you talk about how nothing good has ever happened to you that didn't come from helping someone else and uh yeah when was the first time that you came to that realization and what was the 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 thing that uh, that happened to you that was good because of that help I got out of prison August 23rd, 1969. It was a Saturday. I stayed out all night with some friends of mine from the program, right? And uh, and uh, I, I got home and I was I was up I was up uh, standing in front of my mom's front yard watching different people go by. And and uh, Monday was trash day, and I remember watching this old lady pull out her trash because 
in 69, they just, you just put everything in a big tub, throw it, and then you'd pull it, you know, out, put in the trash can, put in the trash. And, uh, and, uh, this, I walked up to her, going to help her with her trash can. And, uh, and she, I remember her words were, no me robas, de, you, know, you know, and I said, shut up, lady. And I, I grabbed her phone and, and, and I grabbed her, uh, her, her trash and brought it out. I started doing that. I started just taking out people's trash, just trying, you have to understand, I broke into every house in my mom's neighborhood. You know, and uh, and and just robbed some people. So so it wasn't like I was well liked, but <laughs> you know, for about three weeks a month, I I just took out everybody's trash on Sunday. The old people, you know, you know, all the old people, and uh, and so I walked into the house one day, and there was a a, a, a clothing bag, and it, it had a a brown fake suede. Uh, blazer in it and I, I said mom what's that I said you know Danny that old man with the with the bad arthritis you know in his hands uh, mm. he gave that to you and I used to take out his trash and, and and it just it just it just kind of said oh okay it was like the first time I ever got like a gift you know for doing something, but then it's so funny. I think about that because I got arthritis now in my hand. So I think of that old man all the time, you know, and, uh, and uh, I've never stopped. That's what I do. I, uh, every day I wake up, say a prayer, dear heavenly father, you know, let me help, let me help somebody today. And we do all the friends that I have. If you look at the trunk of their car, they'll have socks, thermal underwear, you know, that's what we do. Pass out. Just the amazing. Home, whatever. Amazing. You know? No, I love how you do that. You say uh, what I try to tell my kids is something that uh, that you talk about in this book. And I tell them uh, never miss an opportunity to make someone's day. Oh, and uh, you say something very similar in uh, in this yeah. book and in inmate number one, the documentary. So that really, uh, really resonated with me. And uh, and for those that, that don't know, your for, first uh, acting gig in Hollywood came from help, trying to do help. something good for someone, trying to help somebody out, going to a set, looking for somebody that needed help. I've been helping this kid stay clean and we were doing this little extra stuff and he got me into it. And this, it's funny, I, I, I went to this shoot with him to do, uh, he had, you know, 50 bucks cash. And I ended up running into a friend of mine named Eddie Bunker who I was in prison with, who saw me win the lightweight and the welterweight title, comes up and Trey, what are you doing here? I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a convict. And we kind of laughed because we've been being a convict for free for a long time. <laughs> and he said, we need somebody to train somebody how to box. One yeah, you trained Eric Roberts how to how to box on that set, and then yep. uh, and it seems to be there are these di different moments in your time in Hollywood that really push the ball forward. Like you, it seems like you've been working constantly uh, for those of us on the outside that have been watching things progress, and you've yep. been doing all sorts of things here and there. But then there seem to be these certain moments, uh, like like Runaway Train, like Desperado, where you you have no lines, uh, like Heat which is one of the greatest movies of all time. And you were so yeah. fantastic in that. I just, it's amazing. Uh, um, and it, and yeah. Con Air, then Spy Kids, which opens you up to a whole new generation. And then That's of course right. to Machete, where you are number one on the call sheet. Yeah, I got uh, yeah. to To be number one on the call sheet after all those years and after that upbringing and time in prison, and then to have Robert De Niro walk out of his trailer and say, and I can picture it as you describe it in the book, I can just see him doing it the way you describe it. Uh, number one on the call sheet. Uh, I mean, what did me, that feel like? Uh, well, let me I'll tell you, when he did that, you know, day number one. Huh? Number, <laughs> all, I'm sitting there staring at Robert De Niro in my movie. All I can say was, <laughs> Can I get you some coffee, Mr. <laughs> Come on. And and it was hard for me to say, yeah, I'm the lead with De Niro, because he was awesome. He was awesome. I mean, and he's such a gentleman. And just, you know, he invited me to dinner. We're doing machete, invited me to dinner, you know. And uh and so we go to dinner. I take my two kids, my Danielle and, and uh and uh uh Gilbert, and 
And Danny boy was, he was at school. He wasn't working. He was working. He was gone. And, and so we go up to dinner and I tell him, you know, be cool. Now don't, you know, don't be kids. You know, this is Robert De Niro. The first thing Robert De Niro asked me is something about, he says, you know, uh, how do you say it? He says, Robert Rodriguez is kind of a, a new, I forget the word he used. A tour or something. Yeah. A right. tour. A tour. Yeah. You know, yeah. A tour. And, I, I kind of, uh, my <laughs> son goes, oh yeah, I think he's a little more in blood. They start talking. The rest of the night was spent, Robert De Niro talking to my son, all about the theory of film, the the lighting direction, the different modalities. And I'm like, you know, I was so <laughs> proud of my son, Gilbert, because I, I'm I'm not a student of film. I'm a working actor. I I show up. I know my lines. I don't bump into the furniture. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Stay out of the way. And but my son, he's like a student of film. You know, so he knows all these foreign directors and stuff, names I can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it was just so beautiful, man. And Robert is just De Niro gave him the key to to the his 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 all his uh, memory like film archives. Yeah, yeah, amazing. I love that story. I love that story. I love how uh, how you were surprised at your son, how much he knew about this oh, this yeah. industry and this blew art. Me away. It blew me away. You know, what I mean, and and it's funny because Robert De Niro called me one. One day on my phone says, Danny, I'm coming into town. I got my daughter and her friend. They want to go salsa dancing. I'm not going to have the time. Do you know any? Yeah. So I took Robert De Niro, beautiful daughter. I took her and her friend. We went to, we went salsa dancing. So That's I awesome. left that, I left that message on my machine probably until it wore out. Every I time I walk in, I play it. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to go with Robert. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And originally you were brought on to Heat as a uh, consultant with Eddie Bunker. Is that right? Yeah. Brought for robberies. Yeah. And Robert, <laughs> and, and and Michael Mann knew my uncle in Folsom, you know, for, for, uh, for, uh, 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 he did a movie called the Jericho mile. Mm -hmm. And so at first he called me Gilbert and people don't realize it, but in the movie, Michael Mann changed my name to Gilbert Trail in honor of my uncle. Yeah. He says every time he every time he looked at me, he just thought of Gilbert. So, so uh, uh, we went through three scripts, and they change when they change your name, they change every script. So we cut down a lot of trees, right? And then all of a sudden, he said, "Danny, do you mind if I call you Gilbert? It makes it a lot easier." But no, thank you very much. So, gave my uncle right up. And then you began your Gilbert in that film. And that's uh, and it, the, way, the way you describe it in this book, how he almost apologetically asks you uh, if you can do that. Um, and then how you took that as a tribute to someone who was obviously very impactful in your life. And, you know, I guess uh, good and bad is not really a good way to describe it, but uh, it, it's. Uh, I, brought him a, I brought him a picture of my uncle and, 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 and the union, the Mexican union, the union. And I told him, here, this is a picture of my uncle, but don't let the feds get it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part. No, that is fantastic. Uh, and so from, and from your time in, like I'd heard, of course, I've been, a, you know, a, a, an admirer of, of your work for the longest time. And, um, and I, you know, I heard things about your past and your upbringing, you know, here and there, we mentioned it in an interview here or there. Um, but to put it all down in here, I found this to be uh, very honest, obviously, uh, and a very emotional read. I was very emotional reading this. Uh, quite a few different parts, not just one part, but but quite a few different parts of this really uh, were, were emotional I, you know, as, a, as a reader. I, I don't think I could have done it with anybody else but Donald Logue because, you know, we became really close over the years. And like I said, the first chapter we wrote, I gave it to my kid's mom and she read it and she said, I, 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 it sounds like you talking. And that's yeah, what I wanted. You know, that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted it to be me. I didn't, I didn't yeah. want somebody just to write it. Right. No, it really, it really was. It really comes off that way. Um, and for you, was it difficult to go back and write certain parts of this or uh, is it something that you live with every day and is natural for you to talk about and explore or did you find out anything new about yourself for your perspective on some of these things in the process of writing this? I have to tell you that 
like like things about my family, my mom, my dad. I when I first wrote wrote we wrote it, I gave it to my kid's mom, Maeve, because we had been we've really been together, God, for 20, 30, my son's 33, 435, probably about almost close to 40 years or something. And uh, but you know, we never got married. We set apart and she had two other kids and but we've always stayed you know it's been my best friend and and uh and i let her read the first she said well it sounds really really good but but it's really a little whitewashed down and I said, what are you talking about she says, well there's nothing about your mom there's nothing about your dad you know and these are the things that made you and i never i never put it together that you know she said danny why do you think you've been married four times why do you think you've had children with women that you weren't married to you know I, you know it's like you, you have a you know why do you think me and you couldn't because you can't trust anybody you know you, you and and when i sat there and i talked to donald about it he says it's true you know and uh, me and, and I, like i said I, I don't think i could confine anybody but donald you know so yeah well, yeah, that, that, that emotion, that honesty comes through, that uh, reconciliation with your mom. I mean, all these things, what, what's going on, the movie you're filming uh, in Europe at the time when she passes away. The whole, I mean, my gosh, the whole thing is just uh, just so emotional. But, I mean, it's not just about your time in prison. It's not just about that period of redemption. It's not just about Hollywood. This is about, there are life lessons in here that, uh, that because everyone's going to face some sort of adversity in life. I mean, not necessarily the things that you faced in here, but something <laughs> is going to, uh, they're going to face some sort of adversity. And, uh, and to read these words and what you faced and how you, uh, you use them to move forward to help others is such a gift in writing this book. But like you really have given us a gift in writing this book. And, and I sincerely thank you for it. Um, but uh, other part I was going to ask you about is when you, I don't want to, I want people to read this because there's so many amazing stories, prison parts are incredible. But when you hear Hey Jude today, uh, does it take you back to hearing I, it for that first time? I love that song. I love that song. I, I just love it. Cause I know it sounds, you know, when you're on the yard and you have a riot, people get hurt. When you're in your own cell and you have a riot, it's nobody gets hurt. You're just like, ah, you're just able to just go, just go, just, you know, just screw the world. You know, but you're, you're confined. And, and it's, it's like such a purge, such a relief. And when, uh, sometimes when, when I hear that song, I start jumping around, you know, just, <laughs> I remember, you know, I remember breaking the sink. I remember, yeah, like flood the toilet, you wow. know, and, and just kind of going just completely berserk, you know, and ending up yeah. in in a uh, in uh, yeah, four inches of water. You know? <laughs> no, and did they just play it for you over the loudspeakers? Well, so yeah, you know what, what it was is if you're quiet and good, the, a lot of times the officer in the hole will turn the radio up a little so you can hear it. You know that, okay. and so if it's quiet, he'll put the radio on. You know, and so that was when that came on. You know, do 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 do. Whoa! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah when well, you're describing that, when you're describing that energy, and then you juxtapose it to a riot in the prison yard where someone's putting their hand up to point at who want, yeah. they want shot from yeah. the towers. I mean, the juxtaposition of those in here, yeah. incredible. And then, so there are moments like that. And then there are moments that seem to the reader as so surreal, like sitting down with Charles Manson yeah. and having sort of a hypnotic type experience with, with him. Like, yeah. what was, what was that? Would you look back on that as just a strange no, thing or is it just I remember, another day? I remember, uh, Charles Manson was like a punk. I, what, I don't, you know, it's like he couldn't have, done what he did like in Compton or mm -hmm. East Los Angeles. You know what I'm saying? He got, got some it. little flowers that were from Bogaloo, Louisiana and broken elbow can, you know, and and that were being used and abused by by the the people in in uh, the pimps in 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 Northern California and, and told him, Hey, look, I'm your savior. You know, so they could fall for that. And, 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 uh, 
and left. The, the girls in East LA would have had him turn and drinks. You know I mean, I, mean, I, mean I, and I don't mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm yeah. not putting him down. I'm just, it's a yeah. different, he, he, he was there at the right time and, mm. and pulled him. Right. And then, you know, I mean, the, the power of suggestion on drugs, you know, and so I, I really felt even though they turned into murderers, I really felt sorry for them because I knew that the path that they were on wasn't where they ended up. You know? Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah. And you yeah. did a great job of describing that in here because some people think of Charles Manson, they see that mug shot and yeah. they think they see that tattoo on, you know, they, they, they get that. Yeah. But the way you describe them in there, it's like, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, yeah, the, the, every single chapter in this book is is gold, and uh, the way you describe the, that encounter, the, it's amazing. The, the the white supremacy, the 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 the, the swats got put on there. That's that's just saying hate. That's just saying hate. I'm I am a bundle of hate, you know, and that's sad. I mean, it's just a bundle of hate, you know. And uh, uh, I think. Uh, I think our last, um, you know, the, the, the people, I don't know how to say it, but, but, you know, people brought out so much hate and yeah. it's so sad because we can't live like that. It's kind of like we're on the Titanic looking for a good seat. You know, if we don't change our ways on this earth, it's like we're done. Yeah. You know, and, and scientists are saying we got 15 years to change this <laughs> And, uh, yeah. and so, so, you know, it's like, you know, collect those bottles and, 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 and all that plastic and, you know, because like I said, we're on the Titanic and we're looking for a good scene. Yeah. Well, and talking about, about hate, I mean, all those things you went through as a child, everything you went through in prison, I mean, you could definitely have taken a very easy, different, um, different turn uh, in life there. But what this book really is also about those things I talked about hope and and but it's also about forgiveness and uh that was the, i found that to be so powerful the older i get uh and my books are about revenge without constraint and all this stuff they're filming it in la right now and there's a big revenge story stuff but really what i found personally in my life going forward is that the forgiveness is such a a powerful thing uh to give not just you, the person that you're forgiving but yourself uh, in moving forward and helps move everybody forward in a, in a positive way. Um, and when did you find that, that power of forgiveness? Was that later on in the reconciliation part or was it earlier on as you made that transition out of prison or is it just something that's continued to evolve? I gotta say, I gotta say, I heard that. I heard this the, long time ago, you know, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And it's like, like, you know, uh, who am I to condemn my stepmom? I, I, four marriages and wasn't faithful in any of them. You know what I mean? And 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 who am I to to you know you know, yeah? I protected a lot of kids in the pen, but the reality was, out here, they would call that extortion. In there, it's protection. You, you, you understand? So that was the, you know. But uh, so. I knew, you know, from the start that like, wait a minute, man, I, you know, I better start working towards, towards being a better. And I asked God a couple of, couple of days ago, Hey God, how am I doing? He said, great. You're almost out of hell. Keep, <laughs> keep up the good work. You know, cause you know, I'm not done, you know? So, yeah. so, you know, I, I, that's what we have to do. That's what we, we have to forgive ourselves. We have to like be of service to our fellow man, our fellow woman, our fellow earth. Yeah. No, I love that part about forgiveness. That's probably the most powerful message. Uh, I think we can pass along to anyone. It's just how helpful that is, not just to you and me, but to us as a species moving I, forward. I actually owe forgiving my mom to a, uh, my, my two friends, Max and Mario, because when I moved in with them, they happened to live, but, you know, five blocks from my mom's house. I didn't know it. I hadn't seen her in a few years. And so they were kind of, hey, well, stop by and see your mom. You know, hey, let's. And so I ended up, we ended up going, you know, seeing my mom and slowly, you know, slowly it's like, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a minute, man. I escaped my dad the way I escaped my dad. Drugs, alcohol, gang banging, robbery, running them up. 
she escaped him the way she did. You know, yeah, that no, that's was, amazing. That that part, know, people will get so much out of reading that part of the story, and, and it's a part of the whole story. So you can't just read one chapter in this book. Uh -huh. You have to read. You have to read the whole thing. Um, but uh, another a great story, I and mean, there's so many great ones in here. But you're in line to meet the president of the United States. President Obama, and he steps out <laughs> and he says, Machete, like, who that was, knows you? That, that was it's so, so cool. amazing. That was so amazing. You know, when I, <laughs> I, I was standing in line and I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm standing straight. Am I standing straight? I mean, and when he was, hey, Machete, I know you. I, I, I was speechless. And it was like, uh -huh. wow, that, that movie reached the president. You know, oh, yeah. and when I talked to him, he was just so cool and so amazing. You know, and uh, 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 it was it was it was unreal. My agent almost cried. I mean, he's like, yeah. you, me. you know, I mean, yeah. come on, it's like you're somebody that president knows who you are. You That's know, right? Yeah, yeah. There are very few people, I think, worldwide that don't uh, know who you are at this point. <laughs> so, uh, so to give back with this book and all these stories, is, uh, I, I'm so glad that you decided to do it. Um, there's another great thing in there when, it, when you're talking about from the outside looking in at Hollywood and you talk about this in a story where you're going to film in Hawaii and you're in a seat and there are these two older people in front of you that are yeah. talking about going to Hawaii for the first time. And this husband is uh, keeping a promise he made to his wife from 50 years yeah. ago and has been yeah, saving up his whole life. Yeah. yeah. And then you give them your your seat. And uh, I mean, such a, such a great, great story. One of those small acts of kindness um, that people will never forget. And then, but you also write in there about film at the end of that chapter and you write, the people you meet, the conversations you have, the life that goes down while you're making movies, that is the gold. And, uh, and I love that because they're making mine into a movie right now. We're so involved in all these uh, all these different parts of the script or twit this part or that part or who's playing what part or whatever. But uh, it was so nice to be able to read that uh, and someone like you to, be, to say, hey, the gold is, is all these other things that happen while you're making. The I have made, I have made some, I'm mean, like, like I, to be able to say, I know Jennifer Lopez, you know what I mean? I know Robert De Niro, you know what I mean? I mean, come on. I know Amber Heard. I know Donnie. Yeah. I know all these people. I know Val Kilmer. And, uh, and to, and to think like, man, it's like, if it wasn't for this movie industry, I would have never met them. Michelle Rodriguez, she's an amazing woman, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, uh, I, I say, like, like knowing them and and holding them dear. It's like I I I, I, I in any other business I couldn't have met them. You know, it's incredible. No, oh, it's amazing. You know, the way you talk about them with uh, it, it's just it's fantastic. But you know, one of the other themes of the novel is uh, is God giving you messages at uh, at certain points in your life along mm -hmm. the way. Um, and one of those that really stood out to me was after your cancer diagnosis. And you're going through treatments and you're feeling a little bit down and you walk into your living room and you see a St. Jude's commercial. Yeah. Listen, I wasn't feeling down. I really started feeling sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it's like, what you, I'm yelling at myself and God, why, what, you know, what do you do? You know, I don't, I help. And I'm starting, I'm like, don't I look, I help people. I help people today. And you know what, why are you doing this to me? And I walk out in the living room and there's a little kid with the St. Jude commercial. And it hit me like God slapped me in the face. It was like, bitch, you've had a great life. You, you're, I was 70. I don't even remember. And, and you know what? Here's this kid. He's seven. You know what I mean? And, and he, he don't got a chance. And I thought, my God, you, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, I went to my knee. I, I said a prayer. God help them kids, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to be okay. And I went through my treatment. About three weeks later, I got asked to do a, a an event for these, uh, this band of kids that had beat cancer. Wow. And I absolutely. And, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and I was like, you know, like, un, it was like, I don't know. It was just, it was, uh, it was just almost like, just, you just keep up the good work. You shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing how that's happened and how you share those in this, in this book. Um, and then there's another chapter uh, titled double, double life. Uh, where you talk about going on stage at a high school 
um, to talk about drug addiction and, and that. But that passage, that paragraph was of all the ones like there were some emotional paragraphs in this book. That was probably the one that was the most emotional to read uh, because you go on stage and you're not you don't give your usual talk. You know, if there is such thing as a usual talk. You talk about your son, you talk about your family and what addiction does to those who aren't you, to those yeah. around you, to your family. I it's so um, funny what I, what I, you know what, when I, before I went on, uh, Chispa Sandoval, who was Mexican mafia and, and turned to Christ. That's the only way you can get out of the Mexican mafia is your Christ. He was, he was a, he was a leader in, in the Christian church too. And, uh, and he was taking me around. We were going to different high schools and, and, uh, and I remember getting ready to go on. And then I, I just, drew a blank and I said, Chief Boss, what am I doing? Man, he goes, what do you mean? What are you doing? I, well, my kids out there dying and I'm here telling these kids how to stay clean. I can't do it. Like I, I couldn't do it. And he goes, you know what, Dad? Maybe God wants you to talk about how a parent feels when their kids are using drugs. Yeah. And I went on and I started talking about how I woke up in the middle of the night sometimes screaming my kid's name because I seen him in, in a, in a dumpster, you know, or in a, in a, and I, and these kids, a lot of them were in tears and, and it wasn't, I don't mean, I, they were thinking of their brother or they were thinking, you know, that's what did it. Not, not me. And I remember I, I was in tears. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I did that. And, and I, afterwards I thought, you know what, just by you were right. I was supposed to do that. Yeah. Yep, and that comes across in here, and it's that that's one of the most emotional parts in here. And then you have some other some great ones also. Another one is when you're going through those uh, when you have a when I mean, you've been through a lot. So this subdermal hemorrhage in your brain is what an insane <laughs> chapter that is. And then you have to have brain surgery. They're draining the blood out of your brain. The doctor's like, we've never taken this much blood out of someone's brain before. And you just <laughs> were flying like intercontinental. And uh, and then you go to this rehab after that. And I love the last line in this chapter. You like you say, I pushed out one more lap. And that is really what life is all about, is getting up and moving forward. And you say, I pushed out one more lap. And I, I was I, like, I, I yes. Used to, they had me walking, trying to walk around with a walker because that thing had affected my my equilibrium and my legs. You know, and uh, and it was funny because I, I did it. And I wanted to get better. I wanted to get better. And uh, and I remember I was exhausted. And, and uh, okay, Mr. Trio, that's not. I said, no, no, I'll do one more lap, and uh, I just what I had to do. I just and you know I came out of there and I, just, I could dance. <laughs> oh, man, amazing, amazing. And I know I got four more minutes with you. I want to be very respectful of your time because I know you have a lot going on. So I have my eye on the clock. Um, there's a couple other things I wanted to share with people, uh, and one of those is this Super Bowl commercial that you do, and uh, we're an executive. And you're a little sick at the time, and and one of the ex one of the executives come up and tells you, Danny, we didn't hire you because you're tough. Yeah. We hired you because you're loved. Yeah. And that seemed like another one of those points uh, that really, uh, I don't know, one of these distinctive points in your life when that person said that to you. And then, of course, now you have Trejo's Tacos, which I uh, cannot wait to go and try. Next time in LA, when I'm on set, I'm going please, for please, sure hey, to go. I'm coming in. LA and let me know. I will sure, sure do that because yeah. I was so excited to go and, and do that. Um, and the other part that got me so emotional about that was that in italics, it has you thinking, Mama, you got your restaurant. And I was yeah. like, oh, gosh. Because she was always cooking and cleaning. And you talked about that cooking, cleaning, cooking, cleaning, and putting up with everything she had to put up with. And you say, you got your restaurant. Like you gave that gift to her and to then this legacy now lives on and it's just just an incredible chapter and i love that you wrote that about your mom yeah no absolutely and all right three more minutes um and so what is it like to have a day named after you danny trejo day <laughs> in los angeles and when you fly into lax or when someone tells you they flew into lax they walk in and it's your voice that's welcoming them to your city like, my, what is that like? What is that? My daughter, my daughter was with four of her friends flying into LAX and or they were flying out. I don't remember. But all of a sudden, my voice came over the loudspeaker and my daughter called me and says, Dad, you follow me everywhere. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you can't get away. I love it. No, it's fantastic. And uh, there's another great story about oh, at, at Trejo's um, uh, Donuts. There's a guy in the parking lot 
and you can't remember where you've known him, where you know him from, and your son's talking to him, and it turns out that you served time with him, and things were coming full circle, and you went to look for him after, and he was uh, yeah. he was gone. Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's incredible. Um, but I want to leave people with this since we have to I have to let you go. I, I don't want to because I could talk to you for hours and I'm so thankful that you that you came on to spend some time. Um, but I want to leave people with something you said in uh, in the documentary and then something that your grandmother said that you write about in the book. And in Inmate Number One, the documentary, which everyone should go watch, uh, you said, today I choose a better life. Like very intense, very uh uh, you're making a choice, a conscious choice. Today, I choose a better life. I love that. Everyone can can take something away from that and do that when they wake up tomorrow morning. Um, and then your grandmother used to say something. She used to say, and you share it with us in this book, and you, she said, where there's life, there's hope. Yeah. I think that's just such a, a wonderful message. So uh, so thank you so much for sharing all of those God bless you. Uh, thank with you. us. Thank and you. it's sincerely appreciated. And uh, hopefully I'll run into you in person one of these days. And hey. uh, I'll for sure be at Trejo's Tacos when I'm back in LA next time. I'm telling you, Kay, when you come back to LA, your family on me. Oh. God oh, bless you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. You take care. Welcome to the gear highlight section of the Danger Close podcast brought to you by Schnee's Boots. Now I've been using Schnee's Boots for little over a decade, I think. And uh, as you can tell, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's some miles on these. I've used them in Alaska, in Utah, in Colorado, and uh, I absolutely, Montana, absolutely love these boots. If you followed me for a while, you've heard me talk about them before, seen uh, me wearing them in some pictures. And uh, these guys right here, these are the granites. And these are the first ones that I got. And they fitted me at uh, either Safari Club International or Dallas Safari Club and just fell in love with these boots. There's no middleman with these guys. So they're made in a factory in Italy. And that allows uh, you to get a lot more for your boot, a lot more for your money, a lot more boot for your money. That's what I'm going for right there uh, because there's nobody else in that supply chain. Italy to Schnee's in Montana to you. And you can always call them anytime. Hey, I'm going on this kind of a hunt. What kind of a boot do you recommend? Because they have a lot uh, of boots out there. I think I have eight to 10 and my wife has a couple as well. Uh, but these granites have been a constant companion. These are the same ones that I got all those years ago. Absolutely love these boots. And then these guys right here, these, I think these are called the Hunter twos and love these insulated and, uh, snow muck slush. Just absolutely love these boots. These are some of my favorites right here. Uh, these get daily wear. I think these are called the Montanas, but uh, I just got a new pair uh, that just came in the other day. But these guys I've been wearing for, I think, two or three years now. And this is daily wear. You can tell there's a bunch of dirt on there that's dried now that it's uh, it's springtime here. But I uh, wear these pretty much all winter. Love these boots right here. And then these guys, these are the Hunter pull-ons. And since we moved to the new house, um, then these guys have been, uh, I've worn these every day throughout the winter because the snow is a little, um, a little deeper out here where we are right now. So I wore these pretty much every day throughout the winter. Absolutely love these things. So, uh, Schnees, thank you so much for, uh, Man, all these years of amazing boots. And check them out online, uh, Schnees, and they have a bunch of other great stuff on there. Visit them in Bozeman. Give them a call. Talk to them about your needs for your particular hunt, and they'll point you in the right direction. Awesome. And then uh, I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up right here. Uh, so when you sh when you shop there at Schnees.com, and you spell that S-C-H-N-E-E-S, Dot com. Make sure you use the promo code Jack21, J A C K 21, and then you'll save 10% off a pair of Schnee's boots and logo wear. So definitely do that. Jack21. And these handmade boots, they do sell out very quickly. So grab yours today. Take care of your feet. Don't compromise. Upgrade to Schnee's. And once again, that is S C H N E E S dot com and promo code. Jack 21. All right, since I'm on the road this week, as you can tell, I'm not in my normal studio, uh, I wanted to highlight this. What is this thing? This is a piece of luggage. From where? From 511 Tactical. Uh, now this piece of luggage right here, we were issued it, the first version anyway, back in, I think 2004. 
four when we were doing the uh, uh, the protection detail for the inner Iraqi government. We had these things show up and they were packed full of uh, uh, civilian looking type clothes and that sort of thing. But I used the bag for years. I used it for the next decade, uh, I think. And that was the first version. So if you got one of those, it fell over. It would just like prop it up and fall over. Well, they fixed it with this version, which has been out for a long time now. And uh, these days I have my choice of luggage and still, I have a few of these. My original I gave to 5.11 when Tom Davin, who's now the co-CEO at Black Raffle Coffee, uh, when he was at 5.11 Tactical as the CEO there. And I gave them my original because they didn't have one for their museum of gear. And that was part of a pretty interesting time in Naval Special Operations history, doing that protection detail for the Inter-Iraqi government. So I gave that to them. They gave me a new one. And then I bought two more for the rest of the family. So uh, these things are great. They seem indestructible. And uh, if you have one, you uh, know what I'm talking about. So uh, thank you 511 Tactical for making this thing. I might buy a few more just in case they stop making it. You know, every time I find something or talk about something that I really like, it seems like they stop making it or they change it. So I'm gonna buy a couple more of those. And also because I'm on the road, I figured I would highlight this, my Dynamis belt. Now, I love this thing. Um, and I'm not gonna give away all of its secrets. You're gonna have to go to Dynamis uh, Alliance. You can check out it on the website there. Go to YouTube, type in Dynamis Alliance, D-Y-N-A-M-I-S by my buddy Dom Rasso. And this belt right here, why is it special? Well, it has some quarters in here, just in case you need to make a phone call. No, not really for making a phone call. It's in case you need to use this thing as a weapon. So uh, this gives you some, some weight uh, and it's pretty cool to train with this thing. I might have to put it in a book at some point actually. Uh, and then here you put like hundred dollar bill, $20 bill, just in case you can say, Oh, look, it's just some money. That's all. Nothing else. Uh, and there's a few other things that this belt does as well, but go check out dynamisalliance.com and then go to uh, the YouTube channel for Dynamis Alliance. And uh, there's a whole video there of Dom talking about this belt and everything that it does. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. As you can tell, I'm on the road this week, so we had to do the podcast from a local library. So uh, I sincerely appreciate them locking it down for me. So uh, thank you again to Danny Trejo for coming on. Uh, if you haven't seen, I don't know who could possibly be watching or listening to this who hasn't seen Heat, but uh, his performance in Heat is absolutely incredible. It's one of those moments that uh, propels him forward along his journey in Hollywood. And then to have Robert De Niro step out of a trailer in the filming of Machete and say, number one on the call sheet. I mean, absolutely incredible. So uh, pick up his book. Once again, this is out wherever books are sold. Trejo, My Life of Crime, Redemption, and Hollywood. Check out Inmate Number One and follow Danny on Instagram. He's at official Danny Trejo, and that's T-R-E-J-O. Follow him there and uh, check out his next film. Who knows how he's going to be killed on screen next. So thanks again, Danny. Take care. And for everybody else out there, until the next time, keep fighting.